probably one of the most difficult things to do is give a lecture at 9 o'clock in the morning or directly after lunch. And so I'll try to keep you awake in talking generally about education as we know it today, what we have done, what, what people are doing so far, and what certainly what I know about it. And I think following through of what people said earlier to this morning is that the premise that I'm working on is that it really, conservation of modern architecture is significantly different from what we have done before. And I think in that context, then we begin to look at what education processes are taking place right now. And I would end probably by talking about things that at this point in time, in my mind, in addition to what you've heard from other speakers this morning, as to what needs to be added to that. This statement is one of the things that I would say is personal, but I think it would have heard in the discussions today and in the conversations last night, I think we generally agree to the fact that whatever we are going to do is different from what has happened before, which would seem to be in keeping with whatever modern architecture or the modern movement was envisioning itself at the time. So I think that from the point of view, how we then interpret that and how we judge it, not necessarily has to be done the same way it has been done before, as well as being taught the same way. The other part is that I think we in the discussion and in the title, there is education and training. And I think we need to be very clear that they're not necessarily the same and that probably in judging and educating uh, for the conservation of modern architecture, it probably is going to be more about education and maybe a little less about training as it would be done in the past. The same way related to that is directly that therefore it will be more about knowledge and a little less about skills, skills in the, in the traditional craft tradition. I mean, I think that leads us down to the second part, the third part, which is that it is about design a little bit more than maybe less about craft as we've seen in earlier periods. And this is what we, I think, in our teaching, and this is some of the students that I'm teaching this semester, looking at the traditional craft of making the material. And I think this is where very much our concepts on training and education for preservation have been based on, but I think it's very different if we start looking at what else is there. And I'm using this, this image, which is actually from Alfred Bemis in the early 1930s in a publication called The Evolving House, where he is trying to explain the difference between, in this case, prefabrication, as looking at the automobile industry, and traditional construction. And I think in some ways, as an image, it begins to talk about some of the differences that we need to address in the education of, for the conservation of modern architecture. There's no question, when we look at buildings like the glass house, in whatever way we look at it, that the amount of original material here is relatively limited. All the glass is, is replacement. The only thing we're looking at is the steel frame as the original portion of the original building. However, in no way or form would we consider this not an original building. So I think that, again, is a good example of where the, the percentage of materiality, the authenticity of the materiality is being shifting away from some of the traditional concepts. Which brings me to a very fundamental <coughs> concept we also try to introduce in the, uh, in the position paper, and I think items that you have earlier had earned in this morning, which is the idea of what I would call systemic restoration, which means it's no longer necessarily about the partial individual replacement of elements, but it's looking at the totality of the systems. These are not very significant buildings, and that's not the reason I picked the image. I picked the image because over this shows in one image four different panel systems or cladding systems over a period of 70 years. And so you look at the earliest one, which is probably late 1920s, early 1930s, you can still imagine that you can replace it brick by brick by brick, repair it brick by brick. And all the three subsequent ones, the 1960s curtain wall in the back, um, the rain screen uh, one in the front, and of course the recladding of that earlier building in the front, really are very different conceptual processes, which means therefore conceptually how we restore them, has to be very different. In the discussion of education, we have asked ourselves, who is that audience? And I think we've heard a little bit about that this morning, again in the various papers. And first of all, it's all of us, because we are still exploring how we need to come to the proper educational format. 
It's also people that are already working in conservation, but I think first and foremost, it is also the design and engineering professionals that are right now doing the rest of or the renovation work that's taking place. And I think it came up again earlier this morning where a lot of people, younger architects, that are now engaged in preserving or let's conserving modern buildings are really not conscious as to what it takes. And therefore, I think we have a great responsibility of reaching out to them and educating them as we go forward. Public policy officials we have talked about, and of course there is the general audience, the general population that we all strive to educate and nobody really seems to know how to reach. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to conserve, but also we want to improve the level of intervention, the level and the quality of work. And of course, at the end also, they therefore improve the level of appreciation, all three of which, of course, is very much interconnected in the goals for any educational system. So what's taking place? It's taking place at many different levels. There is the university level, the graduate level, which some of us are teaching and involved in. There is the postgraduate level, people that are already gone to any sort of educational experience and are coming back to look for additional experience. There's the professionals, the CEUs, and for those of you that are not familiar with the American abbreviation, it is continuing education units that I think most professionals in all sorts of jurisdictions are already beginning to look for additional and continued education in order to maintain that professional registration. And then, of course, there's the general tours, the, the press, and the conferences and workshop like these. So far, there is some programs that have a focus on looking at, educate, at preserving modern architecture. There are a number of individual courses, and then of course there are design studios, of which there are actually many more than I anticipated when we started to look at this material. And I think it's a good indication as to the interest and the viability of this. However, one of the fundamental problems still is, is that the relationship between design as a discipline or as an experience versus the conservation is still very mixed. And this is a, a publication of a, a studio I taught a couple of years ago where we brought architect students and preservation students together. And one of the greatest challenges was to get them to talk to each other and not only to talk to each other, but to listen to each other and understand each other in terms of what needed to take place and what the criteria were for the renovations and the additions they needed to perform. And I'm showing you an image of the uh, police building in Philadelphia because it's a good example of where something like this is taking place, where students from Frank Matero's classes at the University of Pennsylvania are working with Jack Pyburn's students from the Georgia Tech in order to evaluate, develop, and study this particular building, which is now empty and probably, uh, I don't know the latest of this, but probably is scheduled for demolition. It's a very nice piece of concrete, and it's Dutch too. And I thought I'd throw it in because we talked about Dutch Mafia earlier this morning. So, um, um, so and I hear students looking at the systems. And I think this goes back to some of the comments that Wessel was making earlier, is that we don't really look at some of these systems, not only from a performance point of view, but also from a historical evaluatory uh, process, because these are very innovative at our time, and they're actually quite clever. Um, we have a tendency to dismiss a lot of this without necessarily studying it in great length. And there then leads this whole series of publication, and I'm showing you one of the Franz Kraft's uh, publications at the, University, at the University of Lausanne as examples of where individual universities, individual institutions begin to develop a background in material on preservation of modern architecture uh, that could be, actually should be much more widely distributed and is very useful to all, all of us. That's the university level. On the postgraduate level, it's actually the activity is actually very, very, very large. And I'm listing Mann, I list the Parks Canada, which you'll hear about shortly. Uh, we're talking about Mark, well, Tommy Lint will talk about in a few minutes. And of course, there is Docomomo, there is, and there's CEUs. I think that's part of the ones that I think is one of the most important opportunities that we haven't explored yet. And then there are all the other activities. <laughs> 
part of this then back to the design studio, but also to the workshops. And as an example, uh, Docomomo has been organized, and Docomomo International has been organizing these student groups, working with students in different locations. And here, this is the group we worked with in Mexico City uh, some years ago. Uh, and again, they were different nationalities, different locations. And what was interesting here, same way in Rotterdam, I think, was that it was not only about them working on a project, it's also have them working together, culturally, linguistically, trying to understand what they're talking about. So in many ways, this was a, a very good example of a, co a collaboration on many different levels that I think is much more of what we need to do. And this is one of the projects where actually the project is ultimately what came out of it was more about planning than it was about preservation in the traditional sense of looking at a historic building. And similarly, uh, we did a workshop in Brazil, in Brasilia, looking at one of the Oscar Niemeyer's theaters, similar with working with the young group of people, trying to make him see what the significance of the building was also before we did any interventions. And then we can go across the world. And these are very, very two examples. There is Bhopal, uh, looking at projects that, for example, Tiki would be very interesting in. And of course, Man uh, as a example of a other network that's working very hard to bring education to the different levels. And then there's, of course, the ISC for Docomomo talking about it. And I think what's important here is that we reach out to the students as engaging in this discussion because these are two of my students in Helsinki uh, working for the ISC, which really talking about what this is all about and uh, continuing the discussion with them and see the kind of theses as they do, which are actually very important in advancing the field in general and also creating the interest that they have. What do we do for the general public? Well, it's the usual, but I think that we are not doing enough of this. Tours, lectures, publications, events, all of these are examples of things that are part of the, the general educational process that we can organize much better and need to be much more con uh, conscious of because advocacy still remains part of the professional development and part of the success of any educational system. And as an example, I'm using here a seminar we did at Columbia last fall, last spring, talking about public housing. And what we, from the very beginning, decided that it's one of those projects, and I think it came up in the discussion about Toronto this morning, is that it is not only about architecture, it's also about social conditions. And for this particular project, you're actually looking at an image of Ralph Rapson's uh, 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 project in Minneapolis, but we brought together uh, a number of people from five different countries talking about public social housing. What was really interesting about this is that we all recognized the significance of it, but we all got stuck on this social issue. Can we ask people to live in something that is no longer up to whatever expectations or codes there is, and where is that social discussion? And I think we we found that we all ended up in the same place where we thought it was important, but all of us were faced with those, those questions at the beginning. And then, of course, lectures. Uh, this is one example where uh, uh, Ivo Hammer and the Tugendhat House come and talk to us in a lecture, both at the World Monuments Fund and uh, Dokumomo. As a tours, we've discovered that that's actually a very good educational tool. As Docomomo US, we are now in the seventh year of doing a national tour day. It's not unlike other countries have architecture day or monument day or whatever, but we organize tours across the country with different people. And over the years now, we are probably in 30 different locations, 20 different states, and thousands of people come and look. Because one of the most educational things for most people is to be able to look at something that you otherwise can't see. And we all want to see what our neighbors have. And uh, so if these tourist people come because they have the opportunities it offers in terms of what they see. Again, example of the uh, tour in New York. And then publications. And I think that, again, what happened, didn't talk enough about this morning, is the aspect of sustainability. I think that the biggest challenge, or not maybe the biggest, but certainly one of the most 
important challenges we face is this connection to the sustainability movement and identifying how we engage both our students and our professionals in that discussion in order to achieve the kind of conservation that we want to achieve because, I, I, frankly, they're killing us right now. So what do we need to do? Where do we need to give attention to? We need to give attention to more to design and planning as disciplines. Because I think that approaching a project or approaching an education simply from a conservation point of view without addressing the general planning and our design aspects of it is really not serving our purpose. I think part of that is looking far more closely at density, use, and function. And by density, I mean both in terms of new buildings, but also the discussion that was alluded to, I think, and I think Charles Birnbaum will have a lot more to say about, is the fact that open spaces now are captured for new buildings. And that projects that had plans very well conceived in terms of open space are now being filled up because of the real estate possibilities. And I think we need to be far more conscious about the planning as well as about the design of the new buildings. Building physics, uh, Norma, I mean, Kyle talked about that this morning uh, at, at some length. I think that if we are looking at teaching new preservation, that really looking at more at the systemic assembly part and therefore at building physics performance part than we've ever done before. And I think that a challenge that I would like to give to some uh, a conservationist in the room is that we are still being hampered by our association mentally to art conservation. This is no longer a job about just material, it's really about the building as a system. And unless we begin to address it as a system, we will not be successful in saving it successfully as we did we we'd like to. And I, again, these are examples of uh, uh, that someone showed this morning about uh, Prentice Hospital in Chicago, where the discussion was partially about appreciation, it was also partially about real estate, and was partially about the, how can it be reused. And again, the challenges that come from that is a discussion we need to teach more and need to re-engage people much more if we want to be successful with that. It brings me back also to design, because design is that other aspect of it as, a, as an active and important preservation tool. And I think more than ever, we need to teach young architects what that means. Because my fear is that they are actually getting more modern than modernism ever was. And I'm just giving you an example of Joe Fresh in an early Skidmore building in the 1950s which is actually more Skidmorean than Skidmore ever was. It's holy than the Pope, I suppose. It's sort of the expression that I'm using here because it's minimalist. And so I think we need to be very careful in how we educate and engage. And again, back to, uh, I think, what Sheridan said about theory and the engagement in the theory because I think otherwise we will lose the buildings in a very different way. I mean, look at the inside of that, the light levels, the stripped down appearance of it is minimalistic, and I don't think that uh, the original Skidmore interior ever looked like this. And this is a sort of a closing image that I uh, want to use, is that this is a new curtain wall that uh, responds to the performance characteristics of uh, what contemporary curtain walls were looking like. It's a corner of the low rise for Lieber House. But you, if you look very carefully, you'll see the little buttons, little screws there. Those little screws have absolutely no meaning because it's a clip-in system like any modern curtain wall is these days. But the originals, of course, had screws in it. So here we get this very funny system that we are replacing this curtain wall in entirely and we are mimicking but lack of a better word, the original construction in order to achieve a visual effect. So I think that there's a, there's a dilemma there that we need to teach much more carefully uh, than we have done so far. So what do we need? These are my questions. And my questions are, how important is design in this discussion? Uh, we, don't, we haven't really talked about this, but I think it is essential in dealing with the large volume of heritage that we're faced with. What, would, what do we need to teach? Is it the standard 
uh, sequence of uh, identification, significance, the re documentation, or it doesn't need to be added to it. And we should do it. Should we do it? Should we someone else do it? Should we bring other professionals into that discussion, into the courses that we can assemble as part of our programs? And what role for science, which is really back to the art conservation and architectural conservation, and then, of course, the building physics discussion that really got started this morning. And then is it global or is it regional? Is it, is it something, are there fundamental problems we all share that would allow us to create an overall program? Or is it far more regional? Are there regional intellectual differences and, and physical differences that would need us to look much more diversified at this discussion? And then, is it graduate? Is it postgraduate? Or do we need to look at different locations? And my final advice to you is that we're talking about making it more popular. I think we need to take Le Gouzier on the New York City subway, and maybe that helps. Thank you.